Okay, we should be live. So, um, I fell asleep this afternoon. I was going to watch the debate, so I missed the first 40 minutes. But Cam, you saw the first 40 minutes at least when they gave their opening statements? Yeah, but um, I was... I, I was somewhat distracted at the time, so I didn't pay full attention. I caught the last part of uh, Airman's talk, and it seemed like he just repeated stuff he's always said, like if, you know, um, did so-and-so do such-and-such? -such? Depends what gospel you read. He basically did that. Uh, and I'm... Yeah, he, he went through um, both something at the beginning of... Um, Jesus's life as recount, uh, accounted in the Gospels and there's something in the middle um, of the narrative and then something at the end of the narrative um, I think at the beginning he gave the example of um, Luke and Matthew having like differing reasons why uh, Jesus was in Bethlehem and in particular the conflicting accounts of uh, Luke's claim to a, a Caesar, uh, sorry, a census under um, Quirinius. And, you know, how historically we don't think that occurred and especially didn't occur because um, of the requirement to, you know, have people go back to their ancient birthplaces, um, you know, of the birthplaces of their ancestors. And then in the middle, he, um, I think he talked about the, ser the so, Sermon on the Mount. I think of Cicero. And then at the end, he um, talked about, like, the conflicting accounts uh, of, like, where Jesus was meant to, or sorry, where the disciples were meant to meet Jesus. Okay. Uh, well, so I start recording after, uh, I guess, their main two speeches. And then I started record when they sat down at this table, went back and forth. And then I got all the Q&A. So should I just play it and then uh, raise your hand if um, you want me to stop or I'll stop it and uh, make some comments? Sounds good. Here we go. And uh, I have the volume cranked up as loud as I can go on the video, so it might be a little quiet. We'll see. One of the highly, most highly educated people in the late Roman Republic. And even though he's so educated, we've got lots of letters that he's written and essays that have survived. Yet there's one occasion when he's writing to Tiro, his, his amanuensis, his secretary, his scribe, and he says, Antony was over for dinner and he asked me to read something. And I said, no, I, I can't because Tiro isn't here and he makes me sound so much better. And we know that Paul used uh, scribes as well on several occasions. In fact, in Romans uh, 16, 22, he says, it says, I, Tertius, who wrote this letter, send you my greetings. So we know that since that's the crown jewel of Paul's letters, that these secretaries of Cicero and Paul probably did a whole lot more than just taking dictation. They did some major editing as well, and then Cicero and Paul would have signed off on it. So if that was good enough for people like Cicero and Paul, why is there such a problem thinking that the gospel authors uh, were the same thing to some of the disciples? Why is it a, a problem that, let's say, John, if, if he's illiterate, that he just had an amanuensis, a scribe, write this stuff down and kind of do the editing or, you know, if it wasn't John, the number one of Jesus' disciples, the same kind of stuff with Matthew and, and this. And maybe Luke was someone who collected the, these testimonies. And if he didn't... Okay, so I, I didn't quite get the very beginning. So uh, what are they talking about here? They're basically... Uh, Ehrman is claiming we don't know who wrote the Gospels. And Lacona is saying, well... Um, or no... Uh, Airman probably charged Lacona with the um, the fact that the uh, whoever wrote the Gospels probably didn't know Greek, and so is Lacona basically saying, well, he they probably used scribes or, or translators or whatever to or secretaries to write the Greek for them. Is that what he's basically saying here? You're muted. Yeah. So. 
uh, Lycona is talking about the use of secretaries or amanuensises um, to, uh, like, as a as a way for authors to capture something in letter form to be then like sent off for for publication or whatever it is, and um, he's asking Ehrman like why if we have these examples of secretaries being used by Paul and I think his example was Cicero, why is it then that we wouldn't um, suspect the same thing could have occurred with the Gospels? Okay. Write it himself, then maybe he had a scribe or something. And same thing with Mark. I, I don't see what the problem is there. Okay, yeah, I'm happy to address that. Uh, about five years ago, I got really interested in the phenomenon of secretaries in the ancient world. And I looked up every reference that exists in Greek and Latin sources that I could find. There is no evidence of anyone at any time, to my knowledge, dictating a, uh, uh, an account in one language to be translated into another by a secretary. I don't know of a single instance. Uh, and the idea that secretaries are uh, seriously rewriting what is dictated to them appears to be without foundation. Uh, as you know, Randy Richards wrote a book on secretaries, and he couldn't find any evidence of that. Well, we couldn't find any evidence of what? Of, of secretaries. There's only two examples in all of antiquity of a secretary who actually composed something for someone else. Well, we're not saying they composed, like, the gospel for someone else. They, it's like they did it. I'm not saying a pseudonymity here. I'm, I'm talking about that someone like, well, I would think Romans probably happened that way with Paul. Paul dictated Romans. Dictated, and all, that's all Tertius did. Yes, that's what secretaries did. They wrote down dictation. Oh, come on. Well, you got Cicero here that says, no, that's not the case, that he no. relied on Tiro to make his I, stuff I give a, I give a, a detailed analysis of all of that for I know my you book did. on forgery and for counter forgery. So it's, it, it didn't happen. So, but, but just take John, for example. So if somebody wants to say that, um, that John, the son of Zebedee, uh, like told somebody what happened and then somebody wrote it down, so once again, as with everything, I want to know what would make you think so. In other words, what about the Gospel of John makes somebody think that that's what happened? The Gospel of John, um, first of all, never mentions the name John. True, John but does none not of Plutarch's lives mention the name Plutarch. None of uh, Plato no, 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 or no, no, Porphyry no. or but Galen Plut mentions Plutarch doesn't name. write a life of himself. The Gospel of John is about Jesus in relationship to his disciples. John is in, I mean, if John was a disciple for the Gospel of John, he'd be in the story, but his name never appears. So what does one make of that? I mean, in other words, I'm, I'm, I'm not concluding anything. I'm just saying that if John is such an important figure who wrote the Gospel of John, what, I mean, you'd have to say, well, he's like, he's so humble, he doesn't mention himself. Or Do you something. believe that John was one of the disciples? Yes. Well, then how... The name John doesn't appear in the Gospel of John. It's probably the beloved disciple. Oh, well, as you know, I, they're, I, happen, they're, to be, they're, I happen to be with some, the minority of scholars that think John, the son of Zebedee, wrote the Gospel of John. Yes, that is a minority. Uh, yeah. Uh, John, the son of Zebedee, was a fisherman in rural Galilee. Yeah. He would not have had an education. Well, no, no, I think he would have had it an amanuensis, a, a scribe, and that wouldn't have been a problem at all. Well, but I mean, how, what is somebody, how is somebody supposed to think you're just not making that up? I mean, what, what's well, the evidence? Well, what's implausible is? about it? What's impl Okay. <laughs> um, what's the evidence that John had a scribe? Well, what's implausible about it? To me, this sounds like I want this to be true. This is possible, um, and so therefore I'm going to believe it. Yeah, well, and th this is one of the things most, like that apologists and uh, Christian historians uh, criticize the most of, is the fallacy of possibly, therefore, probably. And what's interesting is that because he needs to maintain this position for every single gospel, if it's the case that each individual gospel, it's a, you know, a case where, you know, maybe if we're being charitable, 
it's 50-50 that they had an amanuensis or a secretary, then, like, you're, you're kind of starting to get into, like, a bit of a problem in the positions that you're holding. It seems quite implausible now when you're talking about four different authors all having one of these secretaries. And where did he get the money to pay the secretary? And where did he get the money to pay for the paper to write on? And uh, it, it just seems, and, and what Bart brought up, why is he so humble not to say, hey, m me, John, am writing this book for you? Like, <laughs> it's... Um, yeah. So I, don't, I think that Ehrman's position here, though, is coming from some assumptions, at least, that I don't hold. So I think that er Ehrman believes a lot about the disciples um, based on narrative details within the Gospels themselves. But given that I don't really think that the Gospels are very reliable sources of information, I don't really trust like the background narratives that the Gospels have created for characters like Peter, for example. So... Um, I think in Acts, Peter's claim to be illiterate or unlettered, and he has he is cast as like a fisherman on like the shores of Galilee, of the Sea of Galilee, in Mark's gospel, and this sort of characterization of him is repeated in all subsequent gospels dependent on Mark. But I don't really think that there's good reasons to think that that's like what he was. Like we don't get any of that from himself to my understanding. Like, uh, I think Ehrman thinks that first and second Peter are both forgeries. Um, and, you know, I think his primary reason for thinking that is because he thinks Peter is uneducated and illiterate and wouldn't have been able to compose those. But I don't know. I just think he's too credulous. Like, he takes too much of the gospel narrative as an assumption. So why does Lycona think that John wrote it? Um, well, so, yeah, he thinks that uh, John is actually the beloved disciple. Instead of Lazarus. Yeah, and in fact, I actually think Lycona was about to say that in, in the dialogue earlier, but then he, like, bailed out of it and instead made the claim that John wrote the gospel, um, which is what he believes as well. <laughs> but... Um, yeah, why does he think it? I don't know. I haven't heard it spelled out. I think for the most part, it's based upon the traditional like, claims that come from the second century about the authorship of the Gospels and their identification with certain people. Okay, I just have to say this. What's wrong with Christians? Like, why do they just say, oh, someone said it in the second century, so therefore I'm going to believe it? Uh Anyhow, <laughs> I'm going to press play now. <laughs> because we have no evidence of anybody in the ancient world dictating an account in one language to be translated into another. Okay, so if, I, if you see me right now, and then tomorrow I come in, my hair's a whole lot shorter. You didn't see me get a haircut, but you can infer it. We've got stuff from the early church fathers, multiple accounts that talk about the authorship of, of these Gospels. And whether you like my evidence, at least I've got some evidence here that what, I'm presenting the, of who's... Okay, give me some evidence from John itself that is composed by, the God, by John the son of Zebedee. I can't from John itself, but I do from the early church fathers who say it. Okay, who's the first church father right, who said it? Wait a minute, I, you who's could the first, say the same the thing first, about Plutarch who's and the say, first, who's give the first me some church, evidence that Plutarch wrote any church, of those biographies that's oh, no, evident no, in the course, biographies. Of course, of course. That is a question. That's that a question Plutarch for all. Them. That's a question for every author from antiquity. Did this person write it or not? But but Plutarch doesn't claim to write them in any of the fifty surviving biographies. But nobody questions it. We still have good external. Classicists question would... every author from every book from antiquity. They question Plato. They question everybody all the way up. It's a question for every author. But Did nobody this seriously questions whether Plutarch wrote those fifty okay, biographies. Okay, so let me ask what the evidence is that John wrote it. My, again, you say that there's no evidence from the Gospel itself. You say, well, there's evidence from the Church Fathers. Okay, who's the first Church Father to say that John wrote? The it's such a fallacious form of reasoning. I, I really see it as analogous to, um, like, seeing somebody down the street 
like doing something wrong and then you do the same thing and you're like but but the guy down the street is doing it too <laughs> like like I, it's like well uh, like if we can't know or if we don't have the evidence to be confident in something that's just a fact like you can't like point to other examples where we also can't know and then be like, ah, but see, we can't know in that case. So therefore it's okay for us to pretend we know here. Like, it's just silly. Well, and, and the thing is, uh, I think uh, most historians do doubt a lot of things. Like it's all about probabilities. We don't say with a hundred percent certainty of any, uh, ancient text who wrote it. Um, especially when they don't say within the text itself. But anyhow. Yeah, and I mean, there are cases where we can have relatively high confidence because of internal reasons within the text or references within the person's lifetime of the person writing a certain text that we have the title of. Or, for example, like you say, somebody within the text actually claiming who they are and why they're writing it. Um, but yeah. Oh, that would probably be Irenaeus. Okay, when was Irenaeus living? Probably 170, 180. Okay, it's usually dated to 185. When do you date the Gospel of John? Probably 90 to 95. Okay, so 90 years later, you have one person who says it was John. Yeah. And okay. that'd be the same as what, 1950? Uh, yeah, with having no record of it until now. Well, what do you mean, until then? Well, there are other church fathers who know about the Gospel of John. Sure. They don't say anything about John writing it. Well, that's an argument from silence. Okay, so Michael O'Connor is saying, hey, I believe John wrote John because uh, 95 year, years later, a guy said he did. <laughs> yeah, well, and he's, he's about to, like, dismiss um, this form of argumentation which is called argument from silence if people don't know what it is it's um it's when like an absence of evidence is asserted to be an evidence of absence or so for example in this particular case it's where the silence of other early christian authors um in the sense that they don't uh claim the gospel of john to have been written by john that that can't be considered evidence against them having thought that John was the author. Uh, I'm asking for what the evidence is. Well, I gave you. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not are you using the evidence. I'm not saying the silence is evidence that you didn't write it. I'm asking you what the evidence is. And if, if your, your evidence is Irenaeus, uh, we could have a long talk about Irenaeus, but... So, sorry to interrupt lots of it, but arguments from silence can actually be valid. So, for example, if I make the claim that, like, um, last night um, in my backyard there was a T-Rex that, um, you know, stomped through the yard and then walked down the street and let out a big roar and then ate some people and stump, stomped on some cars and then disappeared. Um, like, the, the lack of corresponding evidence that would be expected if such an event really occurred, for example, the police turning up, you know, there being a murder scene and big giant footprints being on the car. Like, the lack of that evidence is, an, is a, effectively an argument from silence. So arguments from silence are actually valid when we would expect there to be evidence if a certain hypothesis was true. So certain claims, they make you expect certain forms of evidence. And when that evidence is not present, and we don't have a good reason why that evidence is not present, then it does constitute an argument against the claim. Yeah, definitely. It. Uh... I, I do not understand how some apologists can't see that, that silence on certain amazing claims is evidence that it probably didn't happen. Like, if you expect anything, like if um, 
uh, what's the Richter scale, like 10? If, you, if someone claims a 10 on the Richter scale earthquake in California and everybody else is silent about it, huh, you're probably wrong on your claim. You would expect someone else to have mentioned it. Anyhow, I'll press play here. Uh, but at least I'm given evidence. It's not as though not... nobody knew who wrote it. And he's the latest one. He's okay. Matthew and Mark have better attestation. If we than could, him. if we could. I, I would say, though, there's, there's clear evidence. You think John is the beloved disciple, right? I do. Okay. There is clear evidence that the beloved disciple did not write the Gospel of John. The Gospel of John indicates that the, that the beloved disciple did not write the Gospel I, of John. I know what you're going to quote. That's uh, John 20, right? The end of John, it basically alludes to the fact, and a lot of people think that that chapter was inserted later, uh, that uh, the author wasn't the, um, the beloved disciple. Is that right? Um, I guess I'm a little bit confused here because um, I thought that there was some indication in, in the end of the text that it was claiming the beloved disciple did write it. Um, but the the end of John in general was kind of a bit messed up um, with uh, some parts of it being inserted after it. And so, yeah, I'm not really sure. But the bottom line, what he's uh, like Kona saying here is um, <clears throat> 95 years later, a guy attests that John wrote John, and that's my evidence. Um, okay, if that's the best you have, so be it. And I think he's speaking in the third person, which would have not been unusual for that day. Jesus speaks in the third person. In other often. words, the author does not claim to be the beloved disciple and claims he got his information from the beloved disciple. I think he's speaking in third person. He is speaking in the third person because he's talking about a third person. It's like on the, it, it, <laughs> it's like on the Seinfeld episode. Jimmy did this. Jimmy did this. And Jesus did it. He said, the Son of Man's going to do this. The Son of Man doesn't have a place to lay his head. And he's referring wow. to himself. We only had 10 minutes for this, and <laughs> I haven't asked a question yet. Oh, no. Well, in our last video, Cam, we just... Uh, you just uh, read an example of uh, something from antiquity 200 years B.C., using first person. Uh, so anytime someone says, oh, no, that's the, they often wrote in third person back then, that's just BS, right? <laughs> well, I mean, there are examples of both, but usually when things are written in the third, third person, it's when um, people are uh, giving like a summarized account of, you know, some events that took place when they weren't part of it. Um, generally, like, I don't, th I think it's more common for people to use the third person when they weren't part of the story than when they were. Yeah. Please. <laughs> Go ahead. <laughs> you can go uh, okay. So, Mike, you, uh, okay. You, you do agree that there are things in the Gospels that are not accurate as related. You don't think the zombies thing happened? I, yeah, I mean, if we're going to say that every single word happened precisely... No, I'm not as, asking in that. ...in a legal transcript... No, I'm no, not asking that. I'm just asking, do you think there are things in the Gospels that are not accurate? I, I don't know. There's, I gave you some candidates that I think... Okay, this bothers me to no end. This is what I, in my experience, have seen apologists do time and time again. Mike Lacona, grow a pair and say, yes, you might lose some fans. You might lose you said, some, subscribe, uh, some, some of your in-group. But you know there's things in the Bible you don't think happened. And that's all Bart's asking. Tell the truth, Mike. Uh, I mean, yeah, I agree with you. I do. I totally see it as being... Um, you know, just don't dishonest. And I think it just shows how he's not really a, a historian, which is a huge claim. And I know that it sounds horrible, but, but I also understand where he's coming from. So recently I observed an interaction between Mike Lyc Lycona and um, Lydia McGrew and Lydia McGrew's daughter. I think her name's Bethel maybe. And they like, they're treating him like whenever there's like a prominent evangelical who doesn't toe the party line and 
makes any kind of like murmurings that they might be giving up inerrancy, um, any kind of murmurings that, you know, maybe they don't consider certain things within the Bible to be true. The, the threat that they face of being expelled from their evangelical in-group is so strong that like, I can see why these people fear saying it. Um, it's a controversial position. And like when you look at the history of like evangelicalism, there have been like massive like conferences and special committees um, drawn up to put out statements on inerrancy. And, you know, there's been uh, the theological divides over it that have like split certain factions of the church um, historically. There's been people who have like been kicked out of teaching in certain seminaries. There's been groups of scholars that left certain seminaries and actually went and started their own ones just over the fact that they disagreed on what was meant by inspiration and inerrancy. Like these are controversial topics and I don't uh, like I can see why Lacona is so cautious about it. But I do think it just, I think it just excludes him from being an actual real historian. And see, and this is, in my opinion, the huge advantage about being an agnostic atheist, because uh, you're willing to say, um, I don't know, I'm not sure. Um, but it's, but it seems like he has so much skin in this game, like Kona, that he has to defend the party line. Uh, he doesn't, he loves Jesus. Uh, to me, I think this is what it's about. He loves Jesus. Jesus died for his sins. He wants to go to heaven. He doesn't want to go to hell. And he doesn't want to say anything uh, behind that table that a 18-year-old uh, person listening, he doesn't want to say anything that might cause them to doubt. And that's why he's being so careful and so evasive here. But anyhow, let's... So they okay. be incorrect, but I would you, say the same of Plutarch. Do you think, yes, do you think that the zombies happened? I, I don't think if we had been there, we would have seen the zombies. Okay. I think that that is a rhetorical literary okay. device going Do you on. think there are other things we wouldn't have seen? So uh, give me an example. I'm asking you for examples. Um, is that the only thing in the Gospels that you think is not accurate? I didn't say it's not accurate. You're putting words in my mouth. Wait. If I said 9-11 was an earth-shaking event, you could say, well, that's not accurate, Mike. And I'm saying, you're missing the whole point. Right. Uh, so I'm trying to get my mind around this. <laughs> that is so ridiculous. Like, there's no way that talking about people literally coming out of their graves and walking around Jerusalem is in any way analogous to calling 9-11 an earth-shaking event. Like, everybody knows that that's figurative language. People getting up out of their graves and walking around streets is not figurative language. <laughs> what the fuck? Yeah. It's, why is Lycona doing this? Um, he says, well, it's because of what I said. Like, well, like, but, but no, but I, I guess my question is, like, he could have... Literally 60 seconds before, he says, if we went back there, yeah, we, we wouldn't have seen uh, zombies come out of the graves. But yet the Bible says zombies came out of the grave. So the Bible's not accurate in that statement. And then he's saying, no, I, I didn't say it wasn't accurate. Like, why is he doing this? Well, because he needs to find a new way to say that it doesn't contain any errors, a new interpretive model. And his interpretive model is that the language being used, I mean, I, I wouldn't be able to describe using his exact words, but it's something along the lines of the language being used doesn't mean what you think it means when you read it literally. And that's the way in which makes it so it's still accurate but yet the events didn't happen if you take them literally. So when Matthew says that the dead came out of the tomb and walked around, you're saying, yep. no, that didn't really happen, but you're saying it's not inaccurate. I, I'm saying it's the same kind of genre there as Peter 
at Pentecost when he's referring to Joel chapter 2 with young men having visions, old men having dreams, and Joel chapter 2 talks about the sun going dark and the moon turning into blood. No, I don't think that they thought the sun went dark, the moon turned into blood that day. I think they're using this as, um, as poetic, apocalyptic kind of okay. imagery. I'm just getting a little frustrated because I'm not getting a direct answer. Well, I'm, I'm trying to give you, I think you're mixing genres here and it's not fair. What's the genre of the, jo of the zombies? I think that this is apocalyptic kind of apocalyptic kind of uh, 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 symbolism that's put in there, just like when they talk about uh, eclipses of the sun and the comets in the sky on many of these occasions. Um, that we can show that these eclipses of the sun didn't happen, but the comet was actually there. They would. That is a slippery slope. Mm -hmm. That 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 really is a slippery slope because, like, if it's the case that this language is um, a kind of uh, like, as Richard Miller would call it, like a semi a semiotic. I know where you're going with this. And signal, then why isn't ascension to heaven and resurrection from the dead not? Because at, because in cases like Romulus, for example, where we have like an ascension and where we have um, things like the like clouds um, and everything like that going on at his death, um, and we understand that as being myth. Well, then why isn't this language when applied to Jesus? It's the same kind of signal like it's weak it's a slippery slope <laughs> mike lacona if you ever watch this video i view the resurrection of jesus the same way you view the zombies as a type of symbolism of apocalyptic uh genre uh as clearly as you think the zombies wasn't real it's clear to me that uh, jesus rising from the dead wasn't real tell me what what's wrong with my thinking mike lacona and if it applies, yeah. if I've done something wrong, maybe you've done something wrong. So Froze Mud just made an excellent point. Um, uh, Mike Lacona did actually lose his job over this exact same thing. If I remember, it was either over the I Am statements, but I'm actually pretty sure that it was the fact that his book on the resurrection made the same kind of claim about the um, zombies and Matthew. And I'm pretty sure he lost his job over that. Or at least he was forced to leave his current position. Um, maybe voluntarily, but, you know, volunteer. <clears throat> How can a man believe that Jesus died, was in the grave for 30 hours or in the tomb for 30 hours or so, and then came back to life, walked around for 40 days, and then ascended into the heaven in front of the eyes of onlookers? How can he believe that and not believe the zombies came out of the graves? Like, is it that much more of a stretch? Well, I think that the difference between them and why he would be uh, hesitant to accept one... Oh, actually, I can think of two reasons. One, the zombies don't imply anything about salvation, whereas Jesus' resurrection does. And two, um, because of the fact that the zombies is like a, uh, a public event, uh, able to be seen by many witnesses, yet we get no uh, supporting, corroborating evidence outside of the Gospels for it. Well, effectively, actually, outside of the Gospel of Matthew, um, it you know there's a strong argument from silence against it. Would mix these. Yeah, I, I, that's a good point. But there's, but again, there's so many other things like the 500 witnesses that apparently saw Jesus. That's only mentioned once in all the New Testament. Does he discount that like he discounts the zombies for that reason? Mm. Touche, Lacona. I mean, I got you. <laughs> Importance in order to highlight the intensity and the meaning behind the event. Okay, I don't know what you're talking about. So, uh, right. Uh, well, keep reading my book. No, I... I, I... <laughs> okay. I'm just sorry, Mike, because you, you don't think that the zombies came out of the tomb, but you want to That's say correct. it's still accurate. Okay. Right. Uh, all right. So uh, uh, <laughs> do you, do you, you do agree that there appear to be contradictions in the New Testament, in the Gospels? I, I think that there are some that I cannot reconcile by compositional devices. And there what, are what stops you from saying there are mistakes? Well, there are some of them, like, uh, let's just say, uh, maybe the Quirinius one. That looks to me like that could very well be an error. 
Okay. But the one that you cited, like, did, did they, Jesus first appear to them in Galilee or Jerusalem? I, I think that that has a, a reasonable explanation for it, and some of these things okay, have so really let me just, good explanations. Let me just review. In Luke, he says, don't leave Jerusalem, right. and they don't. Yep. In Matthew, they're told to go to Galilee, yep. and they do. Yes. Okay, so what's the reasonable explanation for that? Well, I would think that uh, Luke is certainly compressing the account and setting everything in Jerusalem. It doesn't mean they didn't go to Galilee. Okay, uh, pastors out there who have the same problem, that's the key word, compression. Uh, make, memorize that word, say it three times before you go to bed. Yeah, there's, a few different, there's a few different um, magical words. Compression, telescoping, um, magic. <laughs> yeah, uh, do I want to say anything about this? It's, this comes back to uh, possible versus plausible. So whenever there is a apparent contradiction in the New Testament, apologists and pastors will say stuff like, well, but we can have a solution. We can make it fit. And yes, it's possible, but is it plausible? Like, is it realistic? And at what lengths? And one thing that I always said when I was coming out of Christianity was when, when you go down this road, of trying to fit things together, you always have to take the expansionary view. See, I, I, I saw this earlier, but I forget what he's about to say, but I think he's going to say both are true. Like, um, you always have to pile on and make it bigger and the story bigger and bigger and bigger to make everything work. And at some point when I was a Christian, I was thinking, what am I, am I kidding myself? Like, what am I doing here? Am I just doing this so I can believe this stuff? Or am, am I just justifying this to myself? Or did this really happen this way? And, and that really bothered me after a while. Yeah. So I think one human error is that when, when we say this, it's possible, blah, people need to feel inwardly like strongly their confidence decreasing in whatever the thing is that they were trying to um claim in the first place so for example i claim like uh a happened and then i say in order to defend that view i say well possibly b People just don't seem to get that as soon as they say possibly be, they are, they should feel this like lowering of their confidence. But that never seems to happen with people like Lacona. There's it's just possibly this or possibly that or possibly this or possibly that. But they just don't feel how that doesn't actually work. They just don't get it, and it's a shame. I mean, as you said in your opening statement. You've got Luke having the resurrection, all of the appearances and the ascension happening on Easter. But Luke obviously knows it happened over a longer period of time because in his sequel, the book of Acts chapter 1, he says that he appeared to them over a period of 40 days. Wait, Mike, I'm just confused here. Luke says, don't leave Jerusalem. They don't leave Jerusalem. They're yeah. there until the day of Pentecost. But you're saying that he, that he thinks they did go to, to Galilee? No. Why couldn't it be that he is compressing the account? Like, for example, I think that first appearance probably happened in Galilee, but Luke situates it in Jerusalem there when you compare the two okay. accounts. All He's right. talking about okay. the same one. Fair He's enough. Okay. Everything. You can just stop right there. So the appearance was in Galilee, but Luke says it was in Jerusalem. Because and you think that that's accurate? Yeah, he's compressing the account. I see what he's doing. There's no problem there. He's compressing the account for uh, economy of, of time or space. And then he's wanting to emphasize Jerusalem as probably the headquarters what would of the make church. It, what would make it inaccurate? Um, he appeared to them in Africa. <laughs> no, it wouldn't. I bet you anything if, uh, if it said that uh, Jesus was in Africa or Egypt at some point that uh, Lacona would make that fit as well. <laughs> of course he would. I mean, ugh. it's just they, they reach for the hypotheses that would make their view work, but they never reach in the opposite direction. 
and they never test the opposite direction. It's like, as long as we can avoid saying that it's a contradiction and that a contradiction is possible, like, we're okay. Like, it's just all we need to do is make up some elaborate excuse. You know, if I was Bart Ehrman, at this point, you know what I would say? I would say, Mike, please, Mike, for the next 10 minutes, pretend, just please, please pretend that you couldn't care less about Jesus. You couldn't care less. <laughs> Who cares about whether Jesus rose from the dead or not? Now let's talk about the evidence. Like grown adults. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I don't I I think that might be rhetorically effective, but it wouldn't actually work. But yeah, you're right. You're always right, Cam. But why couldn't you say he appeared to them in Africa? Well, if he did, that'd be fine, but if exactly. See? But he's doing a compression here, time compression. He's not it's compressing some... time, he's compressing places. Yeah, one <laughs> says he did not appear to them in Galilee, and the other says that, uh, that one says that he did not appear in Galilee, the other says he did no, appear in Galilee. one says he appeared in Galilee, one says he appeared in Jerusalem. They don't leave Jerusalem. Because so how could they Luke, see him in Galilee? Because Luke is compressing the account, and he situates everything in Jerusalem. How do you know Luke is compressing the account, Mike? Or are you just saying That's this? That's the question. Yeah. How do you know this? This is your hypothesis, Mike. It, That's a, yeah. What you should be saying, Mike, is my theory is that he's compressing. I don't know for, for certain, but if he is compressing and leaving things out uh, on purpose, this could explain it. I have no, the, ev uh, yeah. I have no evidence yeah. to this fact, but I, <laughs> I want to believe this so I can have my sins forgiven. No, 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 Doug. The, the, the evidence he has is that if, if he weren't compressing it, then there'd be a contradiction. Ah, uh, yes. <laughs> so like, uh, heads, I, heads I win, tails you lose type of deal, right? <laughs> yeah. Yes, he does. He obviously and it's knows not accurate. It, but he has it all on Easter, where is it? Again, okay. Acts chapter 1, he's, he's obviously knows that he was there for a longer period of time. Obviously. Yeah, in Acts 1, he's there for 40 days with them, and where is he? He's in Jerusalem. Yes. Well, no, it doesn't say. <laughs> yes, it, it does. It doesn't say that he was in Jerusalem the whole time he ascended from the Jerusalem area on the Mount of Olives, but it doesn't say he was there the whole time. Okay. I see no reason why he couldn't have gone to, to Galilee. Except, in the except he says, stay in, stay in Jerusalem yep. and, and don't leave, and they're, they're in Jerusalem they all the time. from Galilee. All right, like we're just arguing about these nitty things. Look, I mean, the reality. No, I, I'm willing to admit that there are some potential errors in the New Testament. I just don't think Name that's one. one of them that's easily accounted for by compositional okay. devices. So my, que my final question, this will be quick. How many errors would it take before you would agree that they're inaccurate? I don't know a number, um, but as I said, I, you know, if someone on Facebook uh, or let's say your wife, that she has said some false things over time, but she is by and large very reliable. I'd say she's a reliable source, even though she gets things wrong once in a while. What's the number of things? What's the percentage? I don't know. But if it's small, I, th I have no problem saying it's reliable. We're not asking if it's inerrant. We're asking, is it historically reliable? Yeah. You don't even know who wrote Luke. <laughs> uh any comments? But you can you can notice when you listen there that he he says things like, um, "I know of no reason why he couldn't have done X," and that's like a "prove me wrong" kind of statement, and it's the wrong mode of thinking. Like you don't think, "I don't know any inf any reason why this couldn't be right." You ask the question, do I have any good reason to think it's right? Do I have any evidence to support this theory? But he doesn't have evidence. The only evidence that he has is that if these things were wrong, then he would have to give up his belief. Hasn't Mike Lacona ever listened to an, a Mormon apologist? Probably, but he probably somehow has some way of like disassociating the... <laughs> like i can make uh the a mormon can say i can make the uh, first appearance of jesus to uh to joseph smith in his diaries all fit because apparently there's more than one but you know they're not contradictory mike they're just um 
you know, I have a possible solution how to make it fit. There was some compression in one diary and some not. And, um, you know, if it's possible that it can fit together, I'm just going to go on believing it, um, says the Mormon. Uh, you know, yeah. Well, okay. So if I, if I go to MapQuest tonight to try and get someplace, and I know the MapQuest is, is wrong uh, 10 times, 20 times out of the last 100 that I've asked, I'm not sure I'm going to trust it. That, that's a good point, but that's the, the degree of precision that we expect out of something like a map. The debate is, are the Gospels reliable? But they're not maps. They're biographies. They're not, and, the, and, and biographies change the facts in order to make their emphasis. And that's why this is my favorite part of the debate. Go. <laughs> Thank you. All right. Thank you. I'm not sure if this is the cue. So now we move on to our closing statements. Each oh, speaker has five minutes apiece. Dr. Lacona, your closing statement. Well, I want to thank Bart for an enjoyable exchange this evening. I always feel challenged by him in a healthy way, and for that I'm grateful. This evening I've contended that we must assess historical literature in view of the literary conventions in play at the time of writing. In relation to ancient texts, I defined historical reliability as preserving an accurate gist or an essentially faithful re representation of what gist. occurred. I then offered six criteria and contended that the Gospels meet all six Therefore, the Gospels are historically reliable. Bart appealed to differences, uh, the contradictions. Now, I understand the differences as resulting from compositional devices, by and large, that were common to the literary conventions of writing in that era. And um, I also pointed out that Bart has himself contradicted himself pertaining to the value of scholarly opinion. I could have named a couple other things. So by his own standards, he's disqualified himself as a reliable witness if we use those standards. Bart also said that we have no idea who wrote the Gospels and that they were far removed from the eyewitnesses. Well, that's false. The majority of scholars today, critical scholars, um, have ideas of who wrote them. And we saw that their authors were not at all far removed from the eyewitnesses. <laughs> ideas. And some may even have been eyewitnesses. Bart's view is a position that is held by a minority of scholars. If he says we have no idea who kn knew them, who wrote them, and that they bear no... Uh, trace of eyewitnesses. Bart also says that a story is not historically reliable if it only preserves the gist, if the order differs, or if an author alters the detail to make a point that's true, then the story is not historically reliable. But to me that seems a bit wooden, uh, a wooden literalist way to assess a story and is not at all how historians at least would look at reliability. Now, this watch I'm wearing right now was given to me as a Christmas present by my parents around 1979. Um, it's not a quartz watch, it's a Seiko automatic. Is it reliable? Well, that depends on the extent of precision required. If I worked for NASA or SpaceX and was in charge of coordinating things in order to launch rockets, well, then it would be no, by no means be reliable. But for the events in my life, such as meeting someone for lunch or um, catching a flight tomorrow morning, this watch is plenty reliable. In fact, for what I need it, it doesn't even need a second hand. The Gospel authors were writing according to the literary conventions of their day. Those conventions gave them a license to paraphrase, uh, to adapt Jesus' teachings slightly, and to arrange material as they saw fit. And they did. But they took far fewer liberties than virtually any other ancient biographer took. And in the opinion of many critical scholars, the Gospels are rooted and filled with eyewitness testimony. Moreover, if we follow Bart's concept of historical reliability, we'd not only have to reject the Gospels as being historically reliable, but also virtually other all ancient historical literature. Ugh. Why do they always say that? <laughs> like it's a bad thing? <laughs> Yeah. I also, uh, like, I feel this reliance on genre and the, um, <clears throat> you know, what he says, like the literary conventions of the time, 
you know, and calling them ancient biographies. The idea that that pertains whatsoever to the reliability of them and whether or not they contain false or mythic material is just false. Like, you can read, for example, Charles Talbot's uh, What is a Gospel to get a really great overview of literature of the time that we classify as uh, ancient biography that nonetheless contains, you know, um, many mythic elements that nobody believes today. This, the, yeah, just the, uh, the idea that genre can tell us whether or not the miracle claims are true is just absurd. <clears throat> now, not everyone is as interested in these matters as Bard and I are. And of course, that's fine. A far more important matter is whether Jesus rose from the dead. After years of focused investigation of the historical data, I'm quite confident Jesus' resurrection is an event that occurred in history. And if it did, God's message of, uh, or Jesus' message of God's love for us is something we can hold with confidence. I'm sure Bart will agree with me that Dale Allison is one of the very finest New Testament scholars in the world today. After wrestling with numerous matters related to the historical Jesus, Allison writes, while I am proudly a historian, I must confess that history is not what matters most. If my deathbed finds me alert and not overly racked with pain, I will then be preoccupied with how I have witnessed and embodied faith, hope, and charity. I will not be fretting over the historicity of this or that part of the Bible. Allison can have this attitude because he has also wrestled with the data and has also concluded that Jesus' resurrection was a historical event. And that's important because if Jesus rose from the dead, Christianity is true, period. Even if Bart were correct about the Gospels, and he's not. Any more thoughts on that, Cam? I just think he's not a very good scholar. That last thing he said about uh, the deathbed scene, someone's lying in bed, about to die. Was he basically saying, oh, we're not going to, you know, as a Christian, you're not going to worry about problems in, in certain things in the New Testament. You're just going to rely on the fact that Jesus rose from the dead. Um, yeah, it's effectively n none of the stuff matters as long as Jesus rose from the dead. Yeah. And he. Although Dale Ellison was saying something slightly different to that. Hmm. But when he says to the audience that Jesus rising from the dead is a historical fact, did he use the word fact? Or that it's just historical? Mm, I don't actually remember. Yeah, I think he said just historical. Um. Is he lying there, do you think? Because he's speaking on behalf of historians, is he not? Yeah. Um, when he makes his claim that, like, most critical historians think that, for example, the Gospels contain significant eyewitness testimony, in particular such that we can find the miracle claims in the Gospels reliable... I think that that's absurd. <laughs> like, I want to see these surveys because that's not my experience with critical scholars. But anyway. To me, I, it just reeks of comfort. This belief gives me comfort, gives me certainty, gives me joy, gives me hope, gives me meaning, gives me purpose. Um, I can make all the problems in the Bible fit together so I don't have to think about them that deeply anymore. The bottom line is uh, I, it's, they're reliable enough to uh, justify believing Jesus rose from the dead. Remember when he talked about his watch? And he said his watch was accurate enough to meet people for lunch. Is he saying that the Gospels are like his watch? That, you know, it's not perfect, but it's good enough for certain things. Is he saying that the Gospels are not perfect, but good enough to believe that Jesus rose, rose from the dead? 
I think that's the analogy. It's like that's where he wants to set the bar for the context of the debate. Where he wants to set the bar is they're reliable enough to, you know, be able to trust that God rose Jesus from the dead. And is the Quran good enough to believe that Gabriel talked to um, Muhammad or that Muhammad flew to the heavens on a winged beast? Like, is that good enough as well? I have a feeling he'd say no, that's not, uh, his watch would be a little off there, but his watch works well when it comes to the Gospels, if that's the analogy. It just, my goodness. Yeah, I mean, I, my, the thing I'm most critical of is about method. Like, I think that anybody can learn facts about history and, you know, it's required in order to be able to be a historian of a particular period to learn a lot of information about the period in question, for sure. You know, even things like learning languages. But at the center of what it means to be a, a historian is to understand what methods we can use and apply to our historical so sources that enable us to make valid conclusions on the basis of the evidence. Like, if you, if you were to claim to be a mathematician, but you consistently, like, fail to use induction correctly, then it doesn't really matter, like, what numbers you can count to or whether or not you're aware of category theory or, like, number theory or whatever. Your proofs are just going to be wrong if you correctly apply the um uh, sorry incorrectly apply induction like so if you're a historian and you r rely all over the place a fallacy of possibly therefore probably then you're just it doesn't matter how much you know you're just using bad methods and yeah ugh. bar uh bart ehrman ehrman is about to get up and in my opinion, I think he talks about his blog here. He doesn't even talk about the debate that, that they just had, I, I don't think. But to me, that was a sign that he thought, man, I just wiped the floor with Mike Lacona, and I don't need to say anything more. I could be wrong. Maybe he does say some other things, but let's take a listen. Well, yes, and I, uh, I want to thank all of you for coming, and, uh, and Mike as well. I always enjoy these back and, back and forths, and they uh, tend to be, get rather lively on occasion. Uh, I'm going to do a couple things in my concluding uh, time, but before I get to that, I just want to, I want to say that, on, um, uh, that I, I really appreciate the organizers who have put this together. And, uh, and I appreciate all the effort uh, that went into it. I hope that you've, you, found it, uh, you found it useful. Um, on a couple points, Mike and I are simply going to disagree. We're gonna disagree on what is factual information. I think it is factually wrong to say that most New Testament scholars think that the uh, gospels are written by people that we, that we know who wrote these gospels. It's factually wrong. Uh, most New Testament scholars say we don't know that they, they, they in fact are anonymous writers. They certainly were not the disciples of Jesus. That is, that is by far the widest opinion. Uh, moreover, the claim that I would have to reject all ancient history if I reject the Gospels is absolutely false. There are other historical writings from the ancient world that are far superior to the Gospels historically. They may not be as interesting to read, and they may not be as religiously important, but they are far more significant. But I'm not gonna spend the rest of my time talking about that. I wanna do two things. First, I wanna tell you about my blog. Yeah. Uh, I have a blog. So uh, it's called the Bart Ehrman blog. You can look it up. He basically- $134,000. So he basically talks about, he's brought in $134,000 from his blog. Uh, and it all goes to charity to help uh, hungry kids, I think. So he's encouraging people to come to his blog. It's very smart, actually, of Bart, because Christians will say, hey, you know, it's going to charity. Um, maybe I'll support Bart and see what he has to say, even though I disagree with him. And who knows, maybe um, 
from some of the things Bart says in his blog, uh, they'll start to doubt a little bit. I mean, I'm sure if I knew you, I'd be interested in you. <laughs> uh, but I'm not really interested in changing your personal religious views or commitments. I'm certainly not interested in uh, having you, uh, if you're a Christian now, I'm not interested in deconverting you or, or changing your, making you become an agnostic or uh, turning you into some kind of crazy secular humanist. Uh, or if you're an atheist, I, I mean, I'm not, your personal reviews are your personal views. Uh, I am. I, I just want to say, I, he sounds like me here. Like, I, I've said the same thing many times. My goal is not to de deconvert anybody. My goal is not to shatter your beliefs. But my, my goal, and I think Bart's goal, is just to have you think a little differently, be willing to doubt, be willing to say you might be wrong about something. Um, you can still say you're confident in it, but just give yourself a little wiggle room to being open to changing your mind. And I think that's, that's key. So, I mean, I, I just totally disagree. I, I'm, I'm totally interested in reducing these stupid beliefs in the world. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but you haven't read the comment section of my Joel Osteen video. <laughs> Yeah. Well, I mean, I don't want to, I no, I honestly don't want to change people's minds if by changing their minds, they have a worse life. Um, I'm I, I I'm, don't want to do that, but I'm serious about what I just said. Like if you read the comment section of my Joel Osteen video, very quickly, you realize there's a lot of hurting people out there. And if I am the guy who, let's say the one who, gets them out of the belief and it's like at least right now god is their babysitter instead of me <laughs> i don't want to be responsible for uh providing like that's a lot of work to change worldviews and get a support system again and and i know there's organizations out there to help but i would personally feel responsible so my goal is just for for christians or muslims or whoever just to say you know what I believe this, but I could be wrong, and I'm going to be, you know, I'm not going to be... Um, as dog dogmatic. Yeah, as dogmatic, and I'm going to be a little more careful before I vote and stuff like that, because I could be wrong. Interested in urging you to think about what it is you believe and why you believe it. There's never been a more important time than now for people to be thinking about what they really think. People... People love to hear other people who agree with them, who reinforce what they already think. People tend not to like to hear people who challenge them to think for themselves. People like to hear a favorite preacher, a favorite politician, a favorite news channel. People often listen so that they can feel comfortable that they are already right. But maybe we shouldn't be so comfortable. If you don't think critically, you're simply a sheep following where it's led. That is an uninteresting life, and in our times, that can be socially dangerous, leading to horrible results. Mm -hmm. It's important for all of us to think for ourselves, to question our assumptions, to challenge our views, to make sure that what we think is what we really think and not simply what we've been told. He's, uh, he's dissing apologists and pastors right now. He's saying, look, you're sitting in the pews. You're watching your favorite apologist on YouTube. Maybe for a second, say to yourself, they could be telling me something false or um, that uh, maybe they're wrong. They're just mistaken. Whenever you have a deeply held belief that causes some uh, positive emotion in your life, in my opinion, you should work extra hard to um, clobber it, <laughs> uh, to be critical of it. You know, especially the beliefs that give you the most comfort. You should really be wary about those beliefs because those are the ones that will blind you the most.
This is true of politics. It's true of our understandings of society. It's true of our personal ethics. And it's true of our religion. The opposite of knowledge is ignorance. It's far better to be a knowledgeable Christian, Jew, Muslim, agnostic, or atheist than an ignorant one. And I hope this debate has helped to that end. Thank you very much. Uh, it's question and answer period. Uh, I watched the whole thing. I'm trying to think if there was anything interesting in it. Uh, but we've been going on for about an hour now. Do you want to go longer, Cam, or? I'm easy. <laughs> if you're okay. Oh, Dean's here. Hi, Dean. But he probably can't come on because he has a sick baby. Dean is asking you, Doug, what belief gives you the most comfort? Oh, you know what? You should ask my kids that, and they would laugh at you. <laughs> my, <laughs> they, you know what they'd probably say? My dad, comfort? What are you talking about? <laughs> <laughs> well, you're just avoiding the question, Doug. Well, uh, what belief gives me? I guess my belief in chocolate? <laughs> like i De think dean dean I, think if you, what... I, I gotta say this i gotta say this dean if you were to ask my uh coterie of close friends uh they'll be the first ones to tell you um i do have emotions <laughs> but not very much. My emotions more are more in humor. Um, I expect, like, I don't need the comforts of life like most people do. Um, I don't know if it's because of the way I was raised. I'm totally okay with uncertainty. Uh, I assume I'll get cancer tomorrow. I'm okay with that. Uh, <laughs> I, I'm a guy who believes in the um, idea of low expectations. And then when life doesn't um, kill you, um, that's a bonus. <laughs> so you deliberately believe false things. Is that what you're telling us, Doug? Uh, I deliberately focus my attention on low probability events that gives me comfort. There, there's my comfort right there. Oh, I know this guy. Do you know this guy? Uh, no. No. I see some avoiding going on. <laughs> D Dean has got you on the ropes here, Doug. <clears throat> I just said what my comfort was. My comfort was uh, my philosophy of low expectations. That's my comfort. I just admitted it. It just didn't sound convincing. Well, that's because you don't understand the nuances of Doug. <laughs> <laughs> and Dougism. Dougism, yeah. I... I I think I know that guy that was just on there. He's um, he's an apologist on Facebook. But, but do you have like a belief kind of analogous to like a belief in Jesus or a belief in heaven or something like that that gives you the most comfort? No, not even close. If someone can think of one for me, offer it because I can't. Um, like yeah, you, I you, don't. You've known me for what, two, three, four years now? Three years, yeah. What, what deeply held beliefs do I have? Like, I'm even politically, uh, you'd be hard pressed to find something on me. Um, I don't even think I know what you believe pol politically because you don't talk about it. <laughs> yeah, well, because I, I'm willing to say I don't know on a lot of things. I think. Um, I think the Republicans are wrong on many things. I think the Democrats are wrong on many things. I think the Republicans are right on some things, and I think the Democrats are right on some things. I don't believe in any of the religions. Um, so there's politics, religion. Um, oh, my deeply held belief, other than um, that of focusing on low expectations, is... Um, oh, I just had it. Oh, yeah. Um, that 
a good, I have a deeply held belief that a good goal in life is to decrease the sufferings of others. Call me crazy, but that's a deeply held belief I have. And I can't justify it other than to say that it makes me feel good when I don't suffer. Don't take my one belief away from me, Dean. <laughs> you know, you, you can keep your box and you can keep that in your box too. <laughs> my box is where I keep my emotions for the people who don't know. And when the box gets full, I just stuff a little more. <laughs> uh, I don't support this. <laughs> Dean, when did you get here? How long have you been listening? Because uh, Cam and I just are, we were not impressed with Mike Lacona. I'm sorry. Um, from my perspective, Mike Lacona seems like a guy who wishes that it's true and will fit things together as much as possible to make it all work out so he can say it's reliable enough to say that Jesus rose from the dead. Oh, so 15 minutes. Yeah, you haven't been here long. Um, it, it's bizarre to me that in any other book, the same types of claims would just be dismissed quickly. But in the Bible, if you're a Christian or a Jew, it has to be true. The evidence is overwhelming. We have these criteria, Cam, that show that the Bible is reliable. I would love to have Mike Lacona come on our live stream and, and ask him the, what we asked Dean Meadows. You're a librarian. You're given a book. You open it up. You read about a, a giant green lizard that destroys a city. That's all you read in one paragraph. Do you nudge that towards the history part of the library or the fictional part of the library? And then I would say to him, Mike, I'm about to trap you, but I still want an honest answer. <laughs> and then he'll say, well, I have to nudge that towards the fiction. So when you read a book about a man rising from the dead in one paragraph, do you nudge that towards history or fiction? Mike, I'm about to trap you, but I want you to answer honestly. Yeah, I have to nudge that towards fiction. Well, what would make that more historical for you? Well, eyewitnesses. And you can just keep going like this. Okay, we got an eyewitness, but we don't know its name, hit the person's name. We don't know where they're from. In fact, we have 500 of them. Does that nudge it towards history or fiction? We'd go on and on and on. If there was a eyewitness claim in the same book about the giant green lizard, would you, would the nudge towards history be as big as the nudge towards fiction was when you first read about the giant green lizard? Yeah. I suspect not. <laughs> I suspect it's like a teeny tiny nudge. <laughs> in comparison with the gigantic lizard nudge. No, Dean, we're, we're finished. The rest is just Q&A. And I, I'm trying to think. I don't remember any good questions, really. Um, I don't know. <laughs> Frozen Mud says, is the giant green lizard compressed? <laughs> <laughs> Actually, yeah. it's funny because Dean, you used that word a couple of times on our live stream. Used the word, I think, you used the word compressed or compression. Hmm. You might have mentioned telescoping too. Dean, if you ever come back on my live stream, would you be willing to state publicly that you couldn't care less about Jesus for one hour? You don't care about the outcome, whether Jesus rose from the dead or not. Could care? You could not care less. Who cares about Jesus for one hour, and then we'll talk about evidence. Could you do that? There's a 10-second delay, so I'll wait. <laughs> what do you predict his answer will be? 
Uh, I have no idea. D uh, Dean is an enigma. Oh, he says, let me pray about it. <laughs> I. So are you going to get a yes, no, maybe answer? Because <laughs> I honestly think that's the key. I think that is the key for a Muslim to leave Islam, is for the Muslim to say, you know what, I could care less about the Quran. Um, I, want, I just want to know the truth. Um, I'm willing to go to hell uh, in search of the truth. And if that means I have to disavow my culture, my family, my religion, so be it. That's, I think it almost takes that drastic approach to be able to get on the road of, of saying, you know what? We don't know who wrote the Gospels. We really don't. We have no idea. But being able to say that, though, I think is different from really... Meaning it? Um, <laughs> meaning it, yeah. Well, mostly because I think we can intellectually assent to that kind of position. But for us to... Um, you know, really follow it as a different story. We can all agree that we shouldn't bias our judgments of things like evidence based on w what we wish to be true. Um, but, you know, people still do it regardless. Oh, I just remembered one question that came up during this debate. A, a sweet lady came up. Let's see if I can find her. A sweet lady came up and ask the question to um oh here she is let's see if i can back it up um first when christ died ron and was scared and then all of a sudden they were speaking boldly about what they had saw and what they heard and they were even willing to go to their desks um, to, for that claim of who he was. So mm -hmm. how, why do you think if this was all pretty much fabricated, uh, you know, over a period of time, how did the early church start with such passion and there was so much, um, uh, I guess, commitment by the early church followers that claimed they actually experienced Christ yeah. and were willing Okay, so the question basically is, um, the Gospels paint this portrait of some terrified, weak, feebled, feebled uh, men who uh, were terrified and they ran away and basically their lives were transformed and they became passionate and started preaching around the world the message of Jesus. Christians, please stop asking that question. <laughs> it's, I'm just going to say it, it's a stupid question. It is absolutely idiotic. And if you don't know the answer to that question before you ask it, where have you been? Like, have you honestly not heard answers to that question before? Am I being too harsh, Cam? I, I just, I, I hear questions like that, and I hear questions like, well, why would anyone die for what they know to be a, a lie like these questions are so idiotic to me i'm being very honest right now it it, it sh tells me that they haven't even begun to think about these things not even started <laughs> yeah it is the same type of question that i or the same type of comment that i get from people um, who, when I'm talking to them, I'm like one of the first pe people who have questioned something. Um, like my, I remember my brother-in-law saying this and, um, a couple of other people from my family have said it to me. And yeah, I, I think it does demonstrate that they haven't begun engaging with what people from a different point of view would say in response to it. But where, like, what's lacking? Like, don't they have a desire? Like, you don't have to come to a meeting like this to get this question answered. All you have to do is a Google search, for goodness sake. Um, and you'll get a whole bunch of responses from a whole bunch of different types of worldviews and people and so forth. 
it just blows my mind how much people are in a bubble and they, I guess that's the key. Just got to get outside your bubble. But to answer this woman's question, um, transformed lives mean absolutely nothing when it comes to attribution of the, of the reason why their life was transformed. Now that sounds harsh, but let me explain. People have had their lives completely transformed for believing in gods that you think are false, Mrs. Christian here. I'm talking to you, Mrs. Christian. And so to say that we have a group of, a story of a group of people, they went from one way to another, their lives are transformed, therefore it must be true. All you have to do is simply apply that to a belief that you deem false and ask yourself a question, have lives been transformed in other religions that you deem false? Now, maybe a person like this woman will say, no, of course not. There's no transformed lives in any religion other than Christianity. And if that's your answer, if that's what you're thinking, please get out more. Please talk to people. Yeah, but I, I think that, like, I think the premise behind these questions allows us to be a lot more charitable than that answer. Well, um, yeah. So the premise behind the question, in my experience, is this idea and a very strong belief that gets even reinforced by many, like, um, you know, intellectual Christian scholars. This idea that, like, the earliest disciples were persecuted um, for their belief that they saw things that made it so they could be certain that Jesus rose from the dead. And that if only they uh, rec like recanted their belief in Jesus and what they were claiming, they wouldn't have died these horrific deaths. Like that's the premise that is in mind when people are asking this question. And when you have that premise in mind, especially that part about, you know, they were, um, you know, they believed for good reasons and that they really did witness a resurrection. When you have those premises in, in mind, like I think you can uh, really understand why people would ask the question and why it would seem compelling to them. It's just that they happen to be wrong about nearly everything that I just said. <laughs> well, yeah, it's, and I have to constantly remind myself, okay, uh, I was once a Christian too, but I actually don't remember asking questions like that. Um, hmm. I'm trying to be charitable. I really am. But it's like, if I have a question, why am I like, why am I so different than this lady? If I have a question, I will research the answer and not just one answer, a whole bunch of answers and compare and contrast. And for, like, I don't know how many Facebook chats or whatever, um, these questions come up time and time again, like they're slam dunk um, questions. Like it, it just, they can't even imagine. It's like, it, yeah, that's it. It's a lack of imagination that they can't think of any other way. Like, I can totally imagine Jesus Christ never rising from the dead and Christianity looking no different than today. Well, it's obvious for me because I don't believe. Um, but I have a feeling Christians cannot even imagine that. How, how, is that, how would that even be possible in their, in their mind? In fact, if there's Christians watching this, try that. Try for like five minutes really imagining to the best of your ability that Jesus did not rise from the dead, and yet Christianity looks exactly the way it looks today, and try to reason through it in your mind what might have happened. But I warn you, if you try this experiment for five minutes, it's going to change you. <laughs> it, take the possibility seriously. And uh, I think that that is something that um, isn't actually commonly done. Like, and I think that this is uh, able to be demonstrated very easily by asking a simple question. What do you think I would say in response to that? Or like asking a person who you're having a conversation with, yeah. um, 
what they think your position would be or alternatively like or what do you think the um you know people would say who don't believe that jesus rose from the dead for example and often they can't they can't tell you what somebody else would say because they just genuinely haven't thought about it and haven't invested the time in understanding other people's points of view yeah dean dean are you still here in the chat um because i i i'm going to sound cocky here but any question an atheist would ask of a christian i am like 97 percent confident i can answer it from more than one christian point of view i can answer it from the calvinist point of view the uh, Armenian point of view, I could answer that question from the atheist, um, from the liberal Christian point of view, the conservative Christian point of view, the King James only version type of people, uh, the Presbyterians, the Baptists, the Mennonites, uh, the non-denominational evangelical. I might be a little weaker on the Catholic, but any question an atheist could ask a Christian, I already know the answer from the Christian point of view. Almost I'd like ninety five out of a hundred times at least, but and Dean, even you, I, I can't quite remember, but I asked you asked me a question, and I asked you, what do you think I'm going to say? What do you think? What do you predict my answer is? Do you remember that, Dean? I don't. I don't remember what the question was, and I think it was you. I think you said I have no idea how you would answer that, and I think that's the problem. That you should. Well, I, I wasn't saying what I was saying because I knew that that happened. No, 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 no. Sorry, sorry, Dean. I didn't know that happened. But yeah. Yeah, it's. And once this is this is dangerous stuff, what I'm saying now, because once a Christian can answer questions from the atheist point of view, their mind, their reasoning, their world will change when they fully understand it. You cannot go back from that point when you when you understand the the um, other religions uh, or no religions and how they answer specific questions and you under you can still disagree with it of course but once you understand it um, that has an impact on on your current beliefs and uh, it gets it it starts that whole thing of second guessing yourself which um, I don't think is necessarily bad. Although, so I'll praise Dean. Um, I, I think uh, he has role, play, role played an atheist on at least one occasion, right? No. Is that right? No. Not, not in our conversations. I don't think he ever is role played as an atheist. Oh, it must have been somebody else maybe... that you were talking to. Oh no, yeah, he has. Yeah, I thought I remembered yeah. that. Um, yeah, you even praised him for it. Oh, was that the towards the end of the um, the first one? Yeah, like he he didn't do it in one of your sessions with him. He did it. Um, yeah, but see, I think that that's a great exercise. I think role playing a point of view. It, I mean, it's a skill that people learn in like debating circles, right? Because they often have to adopt positions that they don't necessarily hold, and you know, to do so, you have to like understand another person's position. Yeah, and um, I think someone else in this, uh, maybe it was even this lady, asked about martyrdom, persecution, and so forth. Um, there's a difference between knowing and believing and someone can say they know something. I know what I saw, Doug. I know what I saw and still be mistaken. And, uh, the Bible, the new Testament only talks about two, maybe, um, martyrs of the disciples, Stephen and James. I think that's right. And the rest comes from the Apocrypha. Yeah. The rest comes from traditions like much, much later. And still, it's not clear, you know, maybe they did recant, and it's just not recorded. Who knows? Um, well, it's also not, it's, it's um, never clear that if they did, that it would have avoided whatever it was that was going to happen. Yeah, and it's not clear exactly 
when, you know, when you die as a martyr, what are you actually dying for? Um, cause a, a belief, a worldview is made up of a whole bunch of beliefs. So are you dying for that belief or that belief or the, all the beliefs? Or are you just, maybe the, they just died for, um, being troublemakers, who knows? Yeah, well, I mean, if whether or not they said that Christianity was false, um, could, couldn't have stopped them from being killed, then it's completely irrelevant. Um, but yeah, uh, the sources for the martyr stories of the early Christians are unreliable anyway. And this is agreed or near unanimously by critical historians. So if you bring up the question of martyr, martyrs, if you bring up the thing, question about uh, change, transform lives, please know that from my perspective in hell, those are ridiculous questions. Um, they have no bearing to the veracity of the belief at all, not even a smidgen close. <laughs> it's so f far away from evidence of it being true. It, I can't even... Put it in words uh, because we just have so many examples in history of um of it uh of, of people changing their lives and being martyrs for things that you and i would agree are false another one that um makes my uh gitch go into a knot <laughs> gitches gitches on <laughs> gitches underwear uh comes from new zealand so i gotta explain these things is um just as long as you don't mean that it gets your your gooch in a knot Please, Christians, when you hear, uh, when you feel the word transcripts come in your mouth, just stop. <laughs> stop yourself. <laughs> um, there's not, there's no way if I, if, if it were true that the Quran had more transcripts than the Bible, it doesn't. But if it were true, do you think for a moment, for just like a split second, you would think that 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 means the Quran is is more true or the word of Allah? Of course not. Number of transcripts is like, it's a sign of popularity and that's it. And, and here's another thing, Christians, if you're bringing up transcripts, please, for the love of Yahweh, let everyone know that like, what? 80%, 90% of these transcripts? No, it's are, more than 80%, yeah. 95% are like a millennia or 900 years after the purported events. Like these, we have like only a few hundred that are in the first 500 years or 200 years at least. Like let let your young people know these facts before you go spouting them off. Well, we, we actually almost have nearly nothing within the first 200 years. Um, but yeah, carry on. Okay. So yeah, we were talking about what really gets my gitch into a knot. Um, oh, <laughs> here's another one. Christians, when you hear the word attestation come out of your mouth, please stop. <laughs> it's a horrible reason to believe this stuff. And Cam will tell you why. <laughs> like mo multiple attestation. Is that what you're talking about? Yeah. Well, I mean, multiple attestation is relevant if it is the case that the sources can be demonstrated independent. Um, but multiple attestation, when you already know that they're copying from one another, is meaningless, and it doesn't have any relevance to the conversation whatsoever. It's yeah. just like, well, if one author copies from another author, like it, it, it can't increase the credibility of the first author's claims. It's just... Like, I don't know. I mean, have you ever heard of an urban legend? <laughs> like, it seems as though maybe you haven't. <laughs> Those are multiply attested. <laughs> or, but, you know, even this way, like, how many times uh, are the words of Donald Trump attested to in the media? Like, Donald Trump says this, uh, says Fox News, then uh, CNN says according to correspondence such and such from Fox News, Trump said this in the White House. Like, and, and then it goes on and on and on and on. Does that mean what Trump said is true? Of course not. Yeah. It's just silly, exactly. silliness. Silly silliness. So 
So now, uh, apologists, if you're listening, you can now scratch off attestations from your list, martyrdom from your list, um, change transformed lives from your list. Those three are now gone. Uh, you, you can scratch off eyewitnesses from your list because we, we have no good reason to think that um, eyewitnesses wrote the Gospels um, or even sourced it from, from eyewitnesses directly. It's at best hearsay. Uh, so you can scratch that off your list. Uh, you still have Paul. Paul's your best one. So if you're a Christian listening and you're talking to an atheist guy like me, just stick with Paul. That's your best bet. Um, what else can we scratch off the list? Oh, yeah, all the deist type the criteria, arguments. The criteria of embarrassment, please, please, even Bart Ehrman makes that mistake. But please, please, scratch that off your list. <laughs> please. Oh, here's another one to scratch off your list. Um, I don't know if we haven't talked about this tonight, I don't think, but the apologetic of compression <laughs> Please scratch that off your list. <laughs> oh, oh, here's another yeah, one. Optimization Here, strategy of compression. Here's another one, Christians, to scratch off your apologetics list. My grandma got just the right refinancing for her mortgage, just in the nick of time, did a answered prayer. Um, or. I got an A in my logic class because I prayed, or even even this, grandma's cancer is in remission. Praise God, that proves like this sort of stuff. Oh, or um, I went to a, a revival meeting and the guy said on stage that my my back was out of line and I had my left leg lengthened one inch. Stop it! <laughs> Stop it with this stuff. Oh, yeah. Reed says, I found my keys. <laughs> I found a car park. Now, I mean, let's be fair. Nobody really uses those, but... <laughs> the key? No, the keys one. I... Yeah. I mean, people think that, but they don't think it's a, like, uh, is the basis for a good argument for God. Dean, are you listening? I got a story to tell you. You probably... I doubt if you... Uh, I know you're a fan of mine, but you're probably not a big enough fan to comb through all my videos. I've only told this story once, but it's a great one. And it, it's, my wife, this is personal now. Are you listening, Dean? Okay. Um, she, uh, but this is like, I don't know, five months ago. She yelled at me really loudly. Doug, Doug, come into the bathroom right away. Come. And um, so I ran into the the bathroom and she's like, kind of out of sorts and she says my contact it's stuck to my eye and I can't get it out and I've tried and tried I've tried grabbing it and it just it's glued to my eye and it's really uncomfortable and so I opened up her eye and I I'm looking I'm looking I said I don't see it and she said no Doug I know it's there I can feel it and I can see it when I look in the mirror. I know it's there. So I said, okay, I, let me go get the magnifying glass and flashlight and I'll try to help you. So as I'm going to get the flashlight and the magnifying glass, I hear her yell back, oh, never mind. I found it on the bathroom counter. Now, here is a story of someone, my wife, being a hundred percent convinced that what she felt and what she saw was real, 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 real. And it turned out not to be. And I think this story describes religious belief to a T. Dean, I'm sure that you're, I don't know, maybe you're not the type of guy, but I know there's a lot of Christians out there who, like my wife, have seen the evidence of God in their life have felt the evidence of God in their life. And they would say they know God is real. They know it, they know it, they know it. But yet, just like my wife was wrong about the contact, I think they could be wrong about that. So it is interesting, though, because there was this medical case. Cam, this Cam, one... Cam, Cam, Cam. 
you were supposed to pause for 10 seconds and let the story sink in. It was a shitty story. <laughs> you can't start a story by telling everybody that it's a great story. <laughs> oh, last, last time I live streamed with you. <laughs> no, it was a great story. It, re it really was. But uh, but there is this medical case of this person who had like literally like 20 contacts at the back of their eye because they kept on losing them. And like the doctors couldn't believe it when they eventually like f when they eventually found them. Oh, that's a crappy story. <laughs> that is a crappy story. Thanks very much. But I didn't preface it by saying it was a great story. Uh, <laughs> anyhow, but Dean, I, I realize you're the type of guy who, who would agree with me that, yeah, you can't, you can't base your beliefs on, you know, these emotional type things, these touchy feely things that people feel at rock concerts, Christian rock concerts in church. But hear me out here. My theory is that because of some experiences that you had growing up, it impacts you favorably towards the evidence of the belief you already hold. So I don't know your life, Dean, but I'm sure there has been things in your life where you look back on it and say, ah, that was God or in your wife's life, or, you know, the, the joy you felt and love you felt with the birth of your first child. And you say, ah, isn't God amazing? And the miracle of life and so forth. And so now when you have all these thoughts and experiences in your head, and now you're looking at, oh, are the gospels written by Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John? Of course they are. Like, here's the evidence. I think this impacts on how you see the evidence. You're learning, Cam. So um, that was a good pause. Or, 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 or yeah, I was looking. I was looking up something. <laughs> or, 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 ornamental mind is pulling up Snope, Snopes to check out my claim. But here, there's a New York Times article. Search for twenty-seven contact lenses are found in woman's eye. Doctors report. See, but Cam, it was from twenty seventeen. This is why your story was crappy because. Ornamental mind can't pull up Snopes for my story. Like I'm the source. <laughs> you should only tell stories where you're the uh, only source, and nobody can, you know, say anything against it. Th this is when ornamental mind should say the failing New York Times. <laughs> Good night, Reed. It's fake news, bro. It's fake news. Night, Reed. Well, if Reed's not here, why? What's the use of going on? I, I'm I'm not being paid for this, but if if anybody here hasn't watched um, Altered Carbon yet, then you're missing out on something. Yeah, but I'm being paid for that endorsement. So thanks, Cam. <laughs> uh, anyhow, let's call it a night because Reed's gone. Let's call it a night. Reed's the glue that keeps this live stream going. So thanks, guys. I uh, hope you enjoyed the Airman versus Lacona recap debate thing. And we'll see you next time.